Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 9. Let's pray together and ask for God's help. Lord, again, we bow before you and we thank you for this wonderful privilege that we have to come to you, the greatest power in heaven or in earth. And so, Lord, um, we ask that you'd give us understanding and appreciation of this fact and how we can tap into it. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, all of us can think of somebody who we think would never become a Christian. Uh, If you stop and think about it, you know, wives have given up on husbands and husbands have given up on wives and uh, parents have given up on children. Uh, And certainly, you know, we can all think of co-workers and neighbors, people maybe that you've witnessed to in the past and you've just concluded that person is just so far out there, they're never coming to Christ. Amen. Uh, But this account of Philip preaching in Samaria reminds us that nobody is beyond the reach of God's grace and his power. That God's power is able to penetrate the even Satan's grip on anybody's heart and life. And so regardless of the stronghold, regardless of the issues, regardless of the circumstances that you face or they face, we need to remember that the greatest power comes from faith in God. Starting at verse 9, the text tells us that Simon practiced sorcery in the region of Samaria. And I walked up here without my little clicker. So let me, so you can keep up with me here. Uh, Simon practiced sorcery there in Samaria. The word that's translated sorcery in this verse is the Greek word that we get our English word magic from. And uh, when we think of magic today, we think mainly of, you know, in Las Vegas, they do the illusions and, and they, you know, they have your eye looking this way while they're doing something in their pocket over here. And, uh, but, but when the Bible talks about uh, this sorcery, the, the, even the, the magi that we talk about during Christmas, that comes from that same root word. Those were, those were guys that, that used that sorcery for power. And, uh, and it refers um, to the practice of the powers of the spirit world. It was, it was that practice of using powers, even satanic powers, to accomplish and to get advantage for themselves. And that's what Simon was into. He was into satanic, dark, evil powers. And, and you know what? Uh, we find the presence of satanic spiritual power early and often in the history of mankind. When you go through even biblical history, we find it popping up over and over again. Going back to Egypt, when Moses uh, went down to, to Egypt, well, even before that, when Joseph was in Egypt and, and uh, the Pharaoh called for those magicians to come and interpret his dreams and, and they weren't able to do that and Joseph was able to interpret those dreams. And then when Moses went down and told Pharaoh, let my people go, and remember he threw the rod down and, and created these plagues and, and Pharaoh had his magicians that would come and duplicate the same things that Moses was doing with his rod. But remember that when they became serpents, Moses' rod ate up the serpents of the other rod and just demonstrated that God's power is the greatest power. Uh, And today, in our scientific, secular world, it's easy to lose sight of the reality of the spirit world that extends beyond our ability to see. You know, we tend to think that if you can't see it, you can't touch it. If the five senses can't relate to it, then it just doesn't exist. And yet at the same time, it's almost uh, strange that at the same time that we are so secular and scientific, when you watch TV, there is this emphasis recently on that spirit world. There are so many programs that are on TV now, so much emphasis on the dark side and on the evil powers that are out there and things that we can uh, get involved in. 
And the deeper you go into many of the fraternal orders uh, is the more you realize that satanic influence is behind them. I'm not going to name a whole lot of names, but some of the well-known, you know, orders that are out there, they might do good works, but when you get behind the curtain, you find out that there's a lot of satanic influence and anti-biblical material that is uh, undergirding it. And so, uh, you know, you talk about the Masons and, I, oh, did I say I wasn't going to name any? You know, but, but we need to be careful as Christians that we don't just look on the outside, that we, you know, it's not just in Oz that you need to go peek behind the curtain and see what's behind it. We need to make sure that, uh, that it is biblical, that we're following God's power. Uh, we see the desire for a spiritual advantage in all the astrology that people look for. People are looking through the daily paper and online just to find out what Gemini should do today and what this one should do and who I should meet and how I should live my life. You think that's strange? Just look at the millions and millions of people. I'm talking about people sitting in church on Sunday following that. Uh, seeking after some advantage, seeking after guidance in life from uh, outside of the word of God. The same thing is true for palm readers and fortune tellers and mediums. Uh, even devil worship is out there, uh, and, and we need to be careful that as believers, we don't fall into that trap. The fact is that Simon found out that God's power was greater than Satan's power. And that's where you and I need to stand. We need to come to that realization that sure, Satan has power. There is a spiritual realm where Satan, uh, as the prince and the power of the air, where he operates, there are real powers in that evil spirit world. But you and I don't have to worry about that. We need to follow God and follow him. Uh, what happened uh, was that uh, Philip came and he preached the gospel and, uh, and Simon realized that the gospel had a greater power. There's something else I want you to see about Simon. And that is, look at verse 9. And, and in verse 9 says, there was this man uh, called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Let me just pause here for a moment. Simon claimed to be somebody great. One of the danger signs to look out for is when somebody claims special powers for themselves. I believe that God has given different gifts to the church. Uh, I believe that there is a special anointing that God provides Christians to do the work that he's called them to do. But we need to be clear that that doesn't make anybody any greater than anybody else. You need to hear this. Christians are all members of the body of Christ. And the more visible parts are not more important than the hidden parts. The more visible parts can't lift themselves up and say, I don't need you because you're a kidney stuck in the background. Uh, we need to all recognize that as the body, as members of the body, that every part is important. Every member of the body is important. And so I'm going to say that we need to mark that person who feels that he or she is greater than everybody else. You need to mark that person who lifts themselves up and says that, uh, you know, uh, my gift is greater than your gift. That what I do is better than what you do. Uh, you need to mark that person uh, who stands up and props themselves up on some kind of pedestal and lifts themselves up. You know, the higher you lift yourself up is the greater and further you're going to fall. And so we need to be very, very careful uh, about that. Uh, mark that person because the gifts that they have or the position that they hold tends to lift up a man and make him proud. 
The text doesn't tell us how Simon distinguished himself from everybody else, but I can, I can probably guess because I can see looking around the world today how it's done today. Even in the church of Jesus Christ, uh, we find men lifting themselves up, and it usually follows the same pattern. Uh, first of all, it could have been by the words that he told as he told people that he's greater than them. And, and I, you know, you can just flip up and down the dial, and you can see supposedly men of God saying that you need to listen to me and what I say because what I think is greater than what you think. And I am somebody special. Uh, we need to be careful that, uh, that by the words that we speak, that we don't prop ourselves up above others. The second thing that, uh, that could have happened, which happens today quite a bit, is, is by his dress that he made himself look greater than everybody else. So, so you know, now let me be careful now because I'm not knocking, you know, clerical garb and all that stuff, you know, and turning, wearing your shirt around backwards and all that. I'm not, I'm not, people can do whatever they want to do. All I'm saying is that we need to be very careful that even by our appearance and dress that we're not lifting ourselves up and making ourselves seem greater than everybody else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And it goes beyond just our dress. Do you know that there are a lot of things that, and I don't knock people because a lot of it is just tradition that we've been handed down and the way things have always been. But, but I think it's high time that we begin to think about the effect that some of these things have. And, and, and you know, we have uh, in a lot of churches, you got your three big thrones sitting up there. And the guy, you know, he's like king of kings sitting behind the... Now, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, when I go visit other churches and they say, I'll have my seat back there too. But the reality is, let's stop and think about even the little things that we do and the effect that it has on the people. What that is saying is that I am up here and you are down there. And you know what? We take it for granted, but the fact of the matter is that in the Bible, and I've said this before, I don't know if you remember it or not, but do you know that in the Bible there is no division between clergy and laity? That's just not in the Bible. It's in our churches, but it's not in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12 says we are all members of this one body. The head can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We're all members of the same body. And, and so uh, I, I just think that, that no doubt, um, you know, here is Simon propping himself up. Uh, the third thing that I see, it could have been by his entourage that he separated himself. You know, there's some guys you can't even get near them. You know, they got, they got their entourage and this armor bearers and, you know, this one carry my bag and this one carry my Bible and, and you don't even get near me. And just by the, the way that we do things, we lift ourselves up and we say it. We're saying we're giving the message, even if we don't say it verbally, I am greater than you. And I want you to know that there is no power. If you've got the power of God in you, there is no greater power anywhere in the universe. I don't care how many titles he has behind his name. I don't care how high his cheer is up above yours. I don't care how backwards he wears his clothes. I don't care what, how he describes himself. You are a member of the body just like everybody else. And you've got that same spirit of God in you. And so it should be humbling then for us to realize that we have no power outside of God's power. That, that humility should be seen by all those around us. Our humility should be seen by people who interact with us. And Simon may have claimed to be somebody great, but, but he came to realize that the greatest power comes from humble faith in God. Look at verse 10. 
in verse 10, you see that the people were swayed. He says in verse 10, uh, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. You know, it's amazing how, how people are just in search of a leader. People want somebody to follow. And when somebody props themselves up and makes themselves appear to be somebody great, people, unfortunately, are just swayed by that. And it's unfortunate that we, that we flock toward those guys who prop themselves up. And, uh, and that's what happened there in Samaria. Uh, the fact is that people will be swayed by lies and falsehood because we are conditioned to believe with our eyes and, 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 and what we see rather than looking to the power of God. And the display of satanic power convinced many in Samaria that the path to follow was the path that Simon led them on. You know, it I, takes me back to what Paul said. Paul said, Follow me as what? As I follow Christ. If I deviate from following Christ, don't follow me, follow Christ. And there is none of us, no one, I don't care how many letters behind their name, there are none of us that are worth following when we're not following Christ. Our eyes need to be through the, the leaders in front of us and following Christ who's in front of us. Amen. And, and we need to be so in the word of God that we're not swayed because Reverend so-and-so said this, or Pastor so-and-so said that. We need to be so in the word of God that we say, well, he just said something that's just not in the word. And I'm going with the word of God. I'm following Christ. And so uh, there, there is a spiritual reality behind our eyes that, that can see uh, the, the influence that, that people have on others. And it's interesting that after giving heed to Simon and his satanic display, when they heard the gospel preached by Philip and the power of God, which accompanied his preaching, they believed the gospel and submitted to identifying with Christ in baptism. I like that. You know, I, I think about what was going on here in Acts. When I think about it, all the time, no doubt, years and years and years, when Simon was practicing his satanic power, uh, his sorcery there in Samaria, and all the people that had flocked around him and, and, and followed that power, as soon as Philip showed up and preached the gospel with humility and love, the, the, it was like the light bulb went on, and there was power in the preaching of the gospel. Uh, it's interesting that, that, that after giving heed to Simon and his satanic display, when they heard the gospel preached with humility and love, there was a tremendous conversion that took place. Now, the key things that I want you to walk away with this are humility and love. Uh, because it, Philip was not, you know, coming with all of his, you know, uh, all of his garb on. Uh, he, was, uh, he was not coming with all of his uh, uh, apostolic uh, authority as a, as a deacon uh, sent into that area. Uh, he was simply preaching the gospel, and it, it had great effect because of his humility and his love and concern for the people. And so when the gospel is preached with humility and love in the context of a demonstration of the power of God, I'm here to tell you that lives will be changed. And there is nothing that is beyond the power of God's power when we exercise humility and love. You know, I think about in uh, Mark 1, in verses 4 to 7, if you make a, a note of that, um, when uh, uh, John the Baptist came and uh, as the, he began to, to preach, um, and John the Baptist, the text says that he came, he didn't have a whole lot of clerical garb on. 
He just, I mean, read the text, how he came. He came with like, like he just crawled out of the wilderness. And, and yet, in his humble appearance, with the power of God, in humility and love, he affected a whole movement and ushered in the kingdom of God, prepared the way for the Messiah. I guess what I'm saying is that when you look at Philip and you look at John the Baptist, you, you see that, that it doesn't take lifting a man up. It takes the power of God in a man. And God operates when we find ourselves in the context of humility and love. Love for God, love for other people, and understanding that we don't have the power in and of ourselves, that the power is God's power working through us. Anybody with me on that? Amen. Amen. And so the fact is that God's power will change lives when it's manifested through a heart of love and humility. Uh, love and humility create the right atmosphere for the effective preaching of the gospel. And when we talk about the preaching of the gospel like Philip exercised, it's not just going out with a megaphone and preaching the gospel. It has to be in the context of humility and love. It can't be in the context of arrogance and, you know, condemnation. It has to be in the context of humility and love. And when the gospel is preached with humility and love, uh, there will be change. God's power will be manifested. You know, there's a story that's told about a Methodist preacher. And um, the Methodist preacher, uh, it, it was his first church, and he was, he was newly appointed as a pastor of this church. And so um, being a real small congregation, he had to go in early and do everything. I guess he didn't have any, any help or, around there. So he took his son early one Sunday morning to, uh, to go light the heater to heat up the, the church before the congregation, the service would start. And so he and his son walked in to light the heater, and uh, they didn't notice the faint smell of gas from a leak that had, you know, the gas had filled the, the air. And um, so when he lit the match to light the heater, uh, he described it as this blue flame that just filled the room. And both he and his son ended up with, and they were scarred for life with, with burns from that, that uh, gas explosion. And, and, you know, when I stop and think about that, because the point of, of his story was that just one little spark in the right atmosphere can cause a huge effect. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, one little spark in the right atmosphere of humility and love can cause a huge effect. And I think part of our problem is that we're trying to tap into the power of God in our preaching and in our witnessing and in our sharing, but we don't have the right atmosphere, the atmosphere of humility and love. Amen? And, and, and we need to, we, that's something that we just need to search our hearts about. And, and the fact of the matter is that all of us constantly wrestle with that selfish nature that keeps propping itself up, that wants to lift ourselves up, that wants to be somebody great. And as long as we're operating in that atmosphere, we're not going to see the effect and the change that we want to see. A spark of God's power in the atmosphere of love and humility will result in an incredible display of the power of God. And that's exactly what happened there in Samaria. Even in Samaria, where the people believed that Simon was the man with all of his satanic power, people still got converted. Now, you would think that, you know, if all these people are bound under this satanic power and have given themselves to all this sorcery, uh, that, that, that those people would be the last people that you would see a revival in. 
but the fact of the matter is that God can save even the darkest and most satanic person. There is, let me say it clearly, there is nobody that's outside the reach of God's power. So don't get discouraged because people in your family or friends are following some other power or some other doctrine. Live your life in the atmosphere of love and humility and provide that atmosphere for a spark of the gospel uh, to have its effect. Because God's power can change things. The spirit of God can change things. And people may be confused and misled, but remember that the greatest power comes from faith in God. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, he says, Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Even Simon himself, believed and joined Philip, he ended up being Philip's right-hand man in ministry. Can you believe that? Uh, If there was ever a person in Samaria that you could conclude would never come to Christ, it would be Simon. I can just imagine the first few converts there under Philip, and uh, their their conclusion was, well, let's witness to everybody else, but don't waste time with Simon because he's so far gone, he's never coming to Christ. But the fact of the matter is there is nobody that's too far gone. The name of Jesus and the message of the kingdom turned everything around. You know, we, we sang that song, Sharon sang the song, just name the name of Jesus. Well, the the fact of the matter is there is power in that name. And and we need to to learn how to access that power. And and I will say that it takes more than just saying the name. Amen. Uh, It needs to start there. We need to say the name of Jesus. But it takes more than just saying the name. And as believers, we need to figure out how we can access the power of God uh, in the name of Jesus. But it should encourage all of us that are praying for relatives and friends, all of us believers that that have people around us that need the power of the Spirit of God to grab a hold of them. It should encourage us that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is no greater power than the power that comes from faith in God. And so that should encourage us. It reminds us that There is no hold by Satan that is greater than the hold of God's power on a man. You know, some people are worried about generational curses. Some people are worried about, you know, uh, the strongholds that that are in their life. Uh, Some people are worried about that unbreakable grip and some of those habits that, that we can't seem to shake. But this text reminds us that we can give thanks that the greatest power comes from God. And and so I tell people worrying about, you know, especially you hear people asking about these generational curses. Well, you know, it was my great granddaddy was that way. and My granddaddy was that way. And my daddy was that way. And so I don't know. I just I'm bound by this generational curse. Well, the fact of the matter is God's power is greater than any curse that could be put on your family. Somebody needs to say amen. Amen. This text reminds us that we can give thanks that the greatest power comes from God. I'm talking about Holy Ghost power. If the gospel can change a sorcerer like Simon, then it can change anybody. And so we need to trust that that power. We need to understand that he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be trusted. He is worthy to be obeyed. Does anybody agree with me? That he is worthy to be followed. And, and we need to trust in him because there is no greater power. Now, let me say, say this. You know, I was um, driving in this morning and heard um, a preacher on the radio And he gave an illustration that I think fit right here. You know, the accessing the power of God, sometimes we get frustrated 
it's like a person who, you know, is at the switch in their house, the light switch, and they're flicking the switch up and down and no light is coming on. Now, if you're at home and you're flicking the switch and there's no light coming on, what do you think the problem is? <laughs> could be the light bulb. <laughs> it could be what? No power. It could be that there's power. Maybe there was no storm. Yeah. Most likely, with all those possible scenarios, most likely is that you just didn't pay your bill. <laughs> there's power. And it's sitting right on the other side of that wall. And you're flicking the switch up and down. The problem is you can't access that power until you do what you're supposed to do. Somebody hear me? And, and, and when we talk about how great the power of God is, that's wonderful, but it doesn't help turn the light on if it's on the other side of the wall. And, and the reason why many of us are not accessing that power of God in our lives is because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We're not in touch with the customer service department of heaven in prayer. We're not spending time reading what God has given to us as our instruction manual on how to use that power. We're operating in our own steam and in our own energy, and we're frustrating ourselves. We're naming it and claiming it and grabbing it and blabbing it and, and up and down with the switch and nothing is happening because we haven't done what we're supposed to do. There is no greater power. You don't have to worry about satanic power. You don't have to worry about what devil is behind what bush. You need to get in touch with the great power of God, that Holy Ghost power, and stay in communion with him exercise it in the atmosphere of love and humility. Amen? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And maybe the Spirit of God is speaking to you. You need that power in your life. Ask him to help you to exercise it in the right atmosphere, doing what you're supposed to do, being faithful to him. And in this quiet moment, just between you and God, as you have that moment of prayer and ask him, whatever the spirit of God is bringing to your mind, I want to pray along with you. And so an upraised hand and say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. Yes, amen. See those hands. Let's put it up, put it back down. And I'll include you in prayer. Any others? Yes, amen. And Marco, let's stand for that word of prayer. And let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before you one more time. Lord, we confess that we have not been faithful in doing what we're supposed to do. But we thank you that you are the greatest power in the universe. That we have nothing to fear when your power is at work in our lives. Lord, help us to to access that power. Help us to consistently depend on that power. Not to lift ourselves up, not to make ourselves any greater than anybody else, but to exercise that power in the atmosphere of humility and love and see the effect that it has around us, on the people in our families and in our community, on the job, people that we come in contact with. Lord, for each one that raised their hand, you know exactly what they stand in need of, what that issue is that they wrestle with. Lord, answer their prayers. 
meet their needs. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.